Hola a todos. Bienvenidos. Um, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Olga Viso. I'm the chief curator at the Phoenix Art Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today to the virtual talk with artist Magali Lara and curator Cuauhtémoc Medina. So today's talk is um, all completely in Spanish. We're going to be switching over shortly. We are offering live translations. Thanks to Ana from Arvayo Services. Thank you, Ana. So we're switching over now. Empezamos ahora. So we're starting now, and I would like to invite our panelists, Cuauhtémoc Medina and Magali Lara, if they can join our screen. Welcome, and it's a pl great pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much for participating in this conversation, which is part of the program that we have for the exhibition for Francisco Elso. So Magali, thank you so much. Thank you, Magali, and thank you, Cuauhtémoc, and welcome. Magali lives in Mexico City in, by, in Cuernavaca, and she's one of the best known actresses, uh, sorry, artists in um, Mexico of the latest last decades. And she's a key artist in the feminine art in Mexico. And since the 70s, she's worked with uh, image and text as uh, she's a writer, she's a painter, she's frequently collaborates with poets, and she's been focused for the main part of her career to use the paint as an expression of intimate expression and also a formal um, expression. Cuauhtémoc is a curator, he's a critic, uh, and he lives in Mexico City. He's well known worldwide, not just in Mexico because of the exhibitions that he's organized um, all over the place. Since 1993, he has been uh, investigating for aesthetics investigation in the UNAM in the University of Mexico. And since 2013, he's been the chief curator for the um, Art Contemporaneous Art Museum in the WAC. And he has, uh, he's worked with Andrew Frazier, Fer Morales, Ferroque, Murillo, and the list is so long. But at the beginning of his career, um, I don't know if you can share that story with us, Cuauhtémoc, as a young curator, he put together this, uh, you were the curator that exposed uh, Juan Francisco Elso's exhibit in the 90s. And so, like I mentioned in this, um, this organization is part of the program of the exhibition of Juan Francisco Elso. And in, in a moment, I'm just gonna share my screen to start. So this exhibit is, it, it's brief, but it, 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 it reviews his career. He's a Cuban artist that made his career in Cuban and in Mexico in the 80s. So here we see also with his last um, piece, the uh, course against the Colibri. Uh, this was taken in 1988 before he passed away when he was very young. He was 32 years old when he passed away from cancer. And so is the main uh, focus of our exhibit here at the museum. And we started in May and it will be open until September before it moves on to the Museum of Contemporaneous Art in North Miami, which will be its rest, its final stop. And the exhibit was um, inaugurated in the Museo del Barrio in New York, uh, which was an exhibit that I was a guest uh, curator and I worked with Susana Temkin, who was the, who is the curator at Barrio Museo and also the director of the Barrio Museo. This is the first show of Francisco Elso in over 30 years. So it put, gathered up almost all his art collection, about 20 different artworks that includes the better known sculptures like Through America, which was created in 1986 and it represents the Cuban poet Martí and he is represented as a Catholic saint, as the liberator in uh, Latin America and Africa. And so this is um, also a le lesser known piece that they thought these were lost that had not been seen in over 40 years. This is Sergio Palma. This is uh, our, in paper and we found it in the archives uh, for ELSO, which is in the walk. 
And also, this has um, the some of the masterworks, that, the masterpieces that were created in Cuba and also in Venice in 1986, and to his final project, that transpar God's Transparency. This is a group of sculptures that was created with a special paper in Mexico, and it represents the hand, the heart of God, and the in its ethics. And so, some of these sculptures are at at the Moac, and um, it, they are under the care of Guatemoc's team. And also, it has aside from having these um, artworks by Elso, this exhibit also places his um, work with in a dialogue of with over 40 artists that are spread through Mexico, Cuba, the United States. And this exhibit has that context uh, that it's like um, an, it's an individual exhibit within a collective. So it's not just Elso in relation to other Cuban artists like Belki Sayon or Angel Ramirez with mutual interest in the cultural uh, African uh, Cuban culture, but also with artists in the United States and in Mexico with whom also had a great um, relationship. And so this exhibit gathers this group of different artworks from artists like Magali Lara with um, the with the series of Arbol del Cuerpo from 1993 which is an etching and that was included in the exhibit. So Magali was um, the, Elso's wife in the his latest years uh, in the 80s. And we also include artwork from Graciela Turbide, who was a friend of Elso Gerardo Suter, and Elso collaborated with him in a very well-known um, series of the, the Heavens and Hell, a, an artwork by Suter. And so also with Durham, who had an important presence in the mid 80s in Mexico, and he created this piece and also this acrylic as a, to honor the death of Elso after he passed away. So he first, Elso first traveled to Mexico with his friends, Cuban friends. Um, who are in this picture, they were all invited by Adolfo Patiño and Calta Ricky, who had this space in Mexico uh, at that time. And so Elso's interest in Mexico actually started before that. It was at the end of the 70s where there was a very important exhibit that was organized at the National Museum of Bellas Artes in La Habana. And, Portraits of Mexico, which really had a great impact in Elso and his generation at that time. And finally, Elso in the 80s, he traveled throughout Mexico with Magali, Jimmy Durham, and, and other artists throughout um, traveled throughout the country. He established his study in the city of Mexico in San Jerónimo, where he lived with Magali. This is a beautiful picture that Suter took of that space. And also he incorporated a lot of the materials that he would find on the street in the market in throughout Mexico. So the, the eyelashes of the hand of God, he incorporates all these materials. So Mexico was truly important for us. So not just as a young artist and his development and his, the development of his career, but also later on throughout his career. I believe that Elso clearly left his mark in Mexico, a very firm mark in Mexico. And so we've invited to talk about the, his, Elso's legacy, but also about the importance of Mexico in his own formation and development and aesthetics. So thank you both for participating in this conversation and giving us a better context and understand how important Mexico was to Elso. So thank you. I know that Cuauhtémoc, I know that you want to start with a little, talking a little bit about your own personal history with Elso. And so please. Thank you so much. I would like to start saying, um, thanking everybody, not just because I'm a guest uh, here, but I wanted to thank openly Olga Viso, the fact that you, 
took it up on yourself to resuscitate Elso's work in such an important historical moment. And I think this is gonna, it's gonna be clear why I believe that this is such an important adventure. And Olga had also asked me to talk about Elso's influence in Mexico. And my first reaction was to think, well, it's not pointless to say if why the word influence is problematic because astrology makes us think like kind of like the constellations and the stars that it, it makes it seem something like vague and something you can't like pinpoint and is it's hard for a star to fall up fall down on your head practically but basically what we're doing is we have these orbit and this resonance among different artists and agents that it do, they don't just want to consider this as a subject to be studied, but it also needs to be seen what it implies, like this heart that irradiates. And that Elso's artwork is very important, not because he was so audacious and how radical he was, but um, the impact that he has with this field, but also how symbolic it is. Um, for the labor that basically he started. But how can I start saying that actually, it's quite curious that throughout many years, there were many things that were very interesting and had a very important fu function. Uh, but as you can see here, Marta Palau, who is at the center, she is one of the most important artists of Mexico. I believe that you will see how important her role is in the continent in Latin America and throughout America, the Americas. So she had a very close relationship to Cuba and its artists. And in particular, it's very important to point out that the these esoterical aspects and this alchemy that Marca, Marta Palau in, involved in her work, it started with this contact with Cuba in the 70s and she basically got involved with this series of questions that had to be with America and also with African America. And so it has this important part in that, um, in this position. So she starts to expose this view of the spiritual view of America against the modernization of the, the, the different areas. So the next slide, please. But in 1986, I am. Uh, I suspect that it was actually in 81, as a matter of fact, even though it appears in all the texts, she has this workshop with a Cuban artist in La Habana in the Museum of Decorative Arts. And she has this in, important exhibit, and I don't know if it still exists, but as you can see here, and you could see it in the previous um, image, Elso was in the production workshop, and in the workshop or in the production involved, and Marta Palau placed a great emphasis in that relationship, not just because there was obviously this um, closeness, but also because she viewed the community and the interest for these materials, for vegetables, for the, uh, that were original, authentic. And so then the question is, uh, along with the questions that Ana Mendieta brings um, in the next image, please. And also the administration as well of the uh, of this African American aspect of it. So it started to question the possibility of reconsider the art it, from that perspective, African African American perspective specifically, and so it's important with this exhibit, this with the warrior shaman sham uh, medicine men, in 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 the Casa America in Havana, so you can understand the proximity in the Afro Cuban. Um, so, as a matter of fact, all the questions that Elso saw that Carlos Rodriguez Brace uh, that they saw on the in the culture 
and the Mesoamerican culture in 1986 because Adolfo Patino had invited them, which is the character who's got the red shirt and the arrogant attitude. And it's not just in the picture, it's also in his work. He was, that was his characteristic, his arrogance. He brought them to Mexico. He involved them in the agency in this gallery to experiment. And it was very important and very symbolic in the House of the Witches, Casa de las Brujas in the Colonia Roma. And, and he had multiple collaborators. And so it was very interesting how after this trip, Adolfo Patino, if you can go to the next image, the mix, the mixture of that with Bedia, the image that today it's truly very tender for those of us that had the relationship with them and some degree. So the next image, please. And so in, in the agency as well. So it's very important to make that connection. And I'll mention later about Patino, but I did not have the fortune of knowing El so personally, but at 23 years old, when I was starting in the world of the museum, the work, I started to work in that museum with Carrillo Gil. And so it's very relevant because it's the center of uh, the focal point of many stories about it. So, and first it was the, the great loss that was felt at the museum when he passed away in late eighties. And so the first thing that I knew was that we had the issue that was this void that he left because of the fact that the exhibit was gonna have to be postponed or canceled given that he passed away in La Habana. But months later, I suppose that it was through, perhaps through the Museum of La Jolla, through uh, the artist science, Armando science, I learned that the exhibit was gonna take place after he passed away. And here you see the image that I have to thank uh, Carrillo Gil that he uh, allowed us to have this image and it was in the, uh, found in the archives. So, it's very moving for me because it's something that I witnessed. So Armando Sainz wearing this jean jacket on the right side um, with the other staff at the Carrillo Gil Huetoño and before it's Mario Bucanegla. They're trying to find the, the way to put the place, the heart of America. So it is very important to express something. And it's the fact that I was a witness of the fact that the that the installation of this incomplete project of the transparency of God in that moment, it placed a challenge. And it was that the condition of the work, it was this natural materials, but it was truly fragile. And there were, how is it that like these fragments were connected or how were they part of this exhibit? And it just so, it seemed like it was made for that specific space. And as a beginning uh, curator, I had Sainz, Armando Sainz, who was truly a master. I learned so much. I can almost say that Sainz taught me how to work in the uh, actual setting up the exhibits. So he, with the relationship, uh, with the museum and the artwork and the detail that at the end became the reconstruction of the exhibit. So it caught my attention and, and it was something that I want to emphasize that it was truly decisive for me as a person that the mess of God that also made with these branches, with this paper, with um, clay or mud and like, the, these eyes of like guys that was made for Catholic saints, you see this constellation in the interior part in the, of the mask, it implied that this was a mask that it had these inner eyes aside from the holes like for the, um, for the skull. But I mean, Armando understood and he was very eloquent and I remember it clearly that he said, well, it's a mask that the public had to wear in a sense of the, in the sense of the experience in the museum that they could see through the eyes, the heart and the hand um, at the same time that you could see 
inwards from the mask. So this is a God that sees its surroundings, but it, go, it looks within. So that motivated uh, how we were going to build this installation at the, with the Rio Gil. Making an emphasis on this that I, was the key for the understanding of the pre-Columbian movement that was made for Portilla through the clay in the uh, mask and the heart. But it was also led us to the series of decisions that nowadays you can see as, um, as necessary um, because it was Armando Sainz who, who was worried about the fragility of these art pieces and Magali can, Magali can correct me if um, my memory fails me decided that these beds should be placed there, well, these of, of dirt or of, um, of or stones or sand, generating a barrier. So that that way, the those of us that went to see the artwork, we would not disturb the artwork and we would not affect it, but that way, it, it wouldn't be viewed or perceived as a cold modern art. And so by the, doing this, it, it would enhance uh, Elso's uh, intention. Now, if you'll allow me to interrupt for a second, I think that there are things that Armando definitely did develop some things, but the mask, Armando truly went to see us at Havana. So he was very close with Elso. Elso already knew that he was gonna die and so they had the, the, a conversation about how to mount the artwork. So Elso had planned uh, for Carrillo here that it was almost like you had to put the mask on and from there you could see the heart in the hand. And what they say about the dirt, it is something that Armando uh, added, thinking about the pictures that we had seen about the based on the pictures of Elso's exhibits had seen, but remember that the rules were so strict that is also why the Martí had this pedestal and the Cubans almost passed out because it was crucial for the conservation that we had at the Carrillo Hill. It was almost impossible to think that a figure where an exhibit where the author was not there could be placed on the, on the floor. No, no, thank you. It's incredible for me to know this. I did not know that that conversation had taken place beforehand. I wanted to see, but maybe you have a better, a clearer view of the of this. But today, um, it's not very clear to me that the position of the hand was meant to be this one. There is something where the fact that you hang the hand from the way it is that in Carrillo, I remember that his decision was for it to be visible for these strings or, or these uh, this exhibit that will be visible how it was hanging. So I, I thought at the beginning that it was going to be nylon or uh, fishing line so that it could be uh, more discreet. But I think that nowadays this is an element that it's part of the story that historically you have these these interpretations about how you construct and how do you reconstruct the exhibits. So in the next image, please. Well, Cuauhtémoc, I also wanted to mention that the hand in, it's not in the exhibit in the United States because it is in the National Museum of La Habana and it cannot um, travel because of the difficulties of loans between the two countries but the hand is actually mounted on the wall. It's not hanging. Yes, but the hand, it, these uh, little branches that you talk about, they're like bleeding or energy that's bleeding out of the hand. And so uh, of these wounds uh, that, it, that the hand has, and I'm sorry, Magali, they're like these wounds it's what they would call mirror wounds. And I believe that in this part of the, of the exhibit, it's a decision that Armando made trying to preserve as he best understood 
but obviously it was very difficult because it was a full interpretation and this whole idea of the preservation. And I remember that at that time, this whole thing about bringing in the dirt or putting something in the museum, it was not um, something that was, uh, it was not, it was not a usual occurrence. So in Latin America, it was one of the most strict museums. And at the time, it was like Mexico at the time. And I believe that I, it, it's fitting for me to say that one of my greatest mistakes in my career in Mexico is not to include Teresa Margoyos in the Group Seneco. In the first exhibit that we did in Mexico in the museum in 91, it had to do with that, with the fact that the rules of the preservation were very strict in relationship to the, uh, the Riberas, Orozco, Siqueiras, Valens, and all of those exhibits had. So now we have something here that I remember that practically it was, I, I remember the moment when Magali came with a series of documents that Armando or her, they had this intention of having this table of uh, like a, all those documents. And at the time, I, my, I had no knowledge of that. They gave me the task of doing something with all those materials. And I will qualify that as one of the most important moments in my life because I was this profound surprise that the book of Lidia Cabrera, which was a full discovery for me, and I didn't was not aware of it, of that book. And so it's like the Bible, the uh, basically where it's where all the knowledge of the Afro-Cuban community is, is collected. And there were notes and underlying uh, portions of Miguel Portilla and also the uh, ideology of how the human body works. So I had worked with Austin who passed away uh, recently. And I see him, I see that as one of the main privileges of my life to having the privilege of calling my friend but it was very clear in my mind that this was a decisive book of the vision of the academy about the, this cosmo vision for the indigenous uh, and post-Columbian. So if you thought that now we make these assumptions about having this elemental fun, fundamental foundation about the notions of the world in the pre-Columbian world. So it wasn't just that and it was some. It's not that I'm offering my opinion about something that I didn't know that I didn't understand the addition of Elsa in relationship to this. But it was like all of a sudden there was this collection in two different territories. And perhaps it might sound a bit extreme for me to say it, but it seemed like it it didn't even touch those subjects in Mexico in the '80s or the culture of the global perspective. So to have this kind of knowledge derived from of uh, this cumulative work that I would say that it's almost scientific with Manuel Lopez Ossi. And so taking that step, and it was almost like this prophetic work. And it was not just that I was able to work with all these materials, but I was so amazed by the fact that I took Mr. Lopez Austin to the um, exhibit who was completely out of place. And he, and he actually was in shock about the fact that his work had such a big impact in a field that he had never been a part of before. So as you can see, the book, Olopez Austin uses this image that is so important about the Latin America connecting parts of the body with different images of, of Tomna Malamak. Um, that takes account, into account the Nahuatl calendar, like I thought, <laughs> coming out of this, it, and it was evident as a warrior that he, uh, these uh, guides have been placed with like these crucial characters in Latin America. And then the next one, please. And here in Nikisikungo, you see in the list here that this political reference and spiritual reference that is made. So it's between this, project that it's like making a connection between the Afro-Mesoamerican that 
had these cultural connotations and political connotations. And I would also like to add something there. And you know what happened was that for me, it was also a surprise and it was like a revelation because I believe that it was the impact that I had at that time with uh, the, the fact that I was post Patino at that time because um, opposite to our generation who was focused on art culture uh, and more popular art and, and not such ephemeral subjects and, and influences, but, but also there were, there were masters in Mexico because they had read everything they could about about everything that they could about Mexico. So they knew it all very well. So for them to come and see the pyramids, the convents, it wasn't just uh, looking into the past. It was a reflection of the present. And I believe that's a tremendous difference from my generation that was connected with anthropology. And let's say that it was like a something that was close to us, but if we didn't have this idea that we have this conversation in such a practical aspect with even with the materials like also like he had. So I believe that it is such war, a world of knowledge that they had that I even joked with them that it seemed like they had this special treaty with the cultural um, office because they had studied so much, they had communicated so much, and they had dived deep into it. And I wanted to say, and I think that you know this very well, that for me, this was truly an experience of collecting, and it made me to understand that my role in the art could be different, but it worked because in Andro Mosquera, they came to talk at the exhibit, and I remember that I saw Gerardo Mosqueda talking about this experience about Elsa's work being censored. And that experience, and I was talking about a historian and I said, look, here's a critic, art critic talking about contemporaneous art that he said he was not going to cover anymore. So this shock of seeing, it wasn't, just this repetition of what you're talking about and all this work, but the work of Lopez Austin is also in it's a in great measure of the pre-Hispanic concept, cultural act um, concepts that appear in his work, and they continue on to the present and the future. So they continue to be these operators within the culture, popular culture, in the Mesoamerican um, work. But they were uh, presenting something that for me, uh, from my naivety uh, to present this in a special way, but they created this um, adventure to, uh, that you could see it if you'll allow me to say it this way. But I want to say that, make that point that there's a level uh, and where now Olga allows us to be able to face this, to be in front of it. and. It, and it's a series of uh, work and experience. And, and, and an important point is that aside from the transparency of God, the other fragments and other works of, of so they were also in a bit precarious condition and almost invisible in some aspects. But the next image, Magadi Lara and Carlos Aguirre and Gerardo Suter, who were friends of Elso, they were there at the installation deciding how to complete in the next image, please. Pieces like this one, Horse Against the Hummingbird. And so I can't say more than the, this is the in, correct interpretation. They had seen enough to understand how it was that they could assemble this artwork. But I believe that it was extremely important, extremely important coming from the world that I was coming from. And with the norms that historical norms that I was dealing with that Magadi had already mentioned, the vision that they had of continuing with these works, it was a symbol of the fact that we needed to continue with these artworks in a more expansive way or more extensive work. And how could we continue with this? So then all of a sudden, I realized that Carlos Aguirre at the time, his artwork started to create his own conclusions, even though the theme and the relationship between the ecology, how it was being destroyed in Mexico. And this, he was a pioneer in questioning all of these things at, at that time. But 
making these visions and then how to um, put it together with the materials like a, like a, so or incorporating something that like in Carlos work it's basically the absolute beauty of this precarious materials and I see pieces like this installation here and it's kind of like wanting to put together the horse against the hummingbird. So this learning process about the materials and how to use the fragility of, of it all. And I hope that I'm not wrong in this, but it, I hope I, I don't lose the sensation also that there's this gravitational order that is possible and it makes it come alive and next one. So at the same way, it is very clear to me now that uh, Gerardo Suter, not just in this series that he introduces, Olga Viso in her exhibit, but also the next one, please, uh, the image of codices and the Tomaramek in the codices of that uh, Gerardo Suter's uh, piece, or in his, and uh, how he assembles uh, all this, all these materials with a body, and then the next one, and this is Tapoyagua. And the way that Adolfo Patino started to create these altars. So mixing the Polaroid with the natural elements, and then the Frida Kahlo. So all of a sudden we have this, we're weaving all this mystic evolutionary, um, Indian, Indo-American, that I feel that we haven't really focused clearly enough on all of this that I believe that Colibri and others have, we've talked about this collection, but we haven't really landed on the true reference and the importance of what happened in art in Mexico. So, to continue with this same thought process, uh, obviously the hearts that Elso created, and I believe that's Yoloti, but it's the reflection of Leon Portilla, the heart that is the emotional intelligence, the identity that basically has the intelligence of Elijillo in the desire. And, all of a sudden, we have this hard uh, clay from Enzo, and then the next one that it's like this, like almost like the before and after of Mexico. You see artists like Laura Gonzalez and her song of the heart, and then in the next one, please. It's in this ser photography series, and then this piece that I've forgotten about that I find that it's truly uh, shakes me to the core because. It is basically the emptiness of the heart in the Anahuac series for uh, from Suter. So he he how you see this emptiness and also very very prominent, obviously, uh, my hands are my heart from Gabriel Orozco in ninety one. That we know that this comes from the moment that Orozco was an assistant of, of Migorovic uh, in this play workshop and uh, in, in Puebla. And so it's like an echo of the work of Elso. And so it, it continues to be a little bit with Gabriel Orozco, the next one. Like Olivia de Boa said, you had to, this is the serpent and it is made out of different fragments of that Orozco made, and if we can move to the next one, please, against the traveler from Elso. So El Chitle, that was made with El Chitle. So I think that there's a connection there. And I remember that in the materials here, we have this conversation with Armando about how could we complete it and complement it. So then we had to get the ashes of El Chitle to try to maintain that authentic uh, intention or, or work. And at the same time, you can think about this, this shift about the pieces of, for example, Gracia Viturbide, 
like cemetery. Graciela had photographed El so Magadi at their wedding. The next picture, please. Here, uh, you see, there's a, a relationship with something that we touch upon. It, this, this concern of Armando Sanz uh, about the fragmentality of Elso's work. So it became this awe of the possibility of having all these materials that really would not would had would not be have the same longevity. And so the next one, please. And the way that Silvia Gruner involves not just the same um, closeness with Mendieta, but also operations that have this kind of cut, so to speak, of small altars and different materials. And not just with this intervention, it is extraordinary in Tepoztlan, and then if we can go into us, and we include the use that he had of a uh, small res residual uh, pre-Columbian materials. And I believe that this is a stage that it's unquestionable that during these installations, what this represented, it had such a great impact that it basically came to tie up all the loose, a lot of loose ends. And I think that I'm gonna finish saying that, of course, the next one, please. That's the end. <laughs> so we're missing some, maybe, no, no. I believe that it's very important to say that what we have here is something that we have. It's with this sensation that this heart of America is incomplete and that these are different attempts to try to reconstruct this heart of America that also had intended. And I think that it's important to, you know, question how important is it to revive this? And so it makes it possible for us to continue to build on that heart of America. Thank you. Well, I'm very grateful for what you're shared, but I do have some things that I would like to clarify. I believe that what happened when the Cubans arrived in Mexico, I, I think I've also, uh, uh, Gustavo Perez Monton, remember that he was also, he was in Tabasco, he was working with Julieta, Julieta Campo, that had to do with this indigenous cultures and they had all worked with the relationship of the materials in this um, generational view of them. And it also had another intention. And all I believe that the understanding that Ezra had with Austin, that all the reading he had uh, with uh, all these books that talked about the different myths. And I remember, and I actually had that book, it's in pieces now, but it, it had a great impact on me because they came from Venezuela. So they had this relationship with things that came from Venezuela and uh, re readings from Africa. So there was a lot of African literature and the African literature at the time, uh, he and they let me borrow some books and they're truly fabulous. They were master readers. And so we have this mixture of the contemporary with the, uh, and, this historic the history of, and it was it wasn't just one thing or the other it was this thought in mexico that it was the possible based on the materials to be aware of the continuity and so i also remember that if you remember kelly jones when came to mexico that worked with you uh curating she had this very specific uh criticism of the book saying that we were not under, we were not understanding what we were proposing but that's why the ideology became so important in the materials for him to be a bit suspended because i believe that in 90s when the cuban aspect of it came into it when the this precarious uh situation and the rebellious nature and of this new man that's a strong image in all of them of a new Latin American man. So there we try to 
have this way of carrying the world based on the material. So they were very, very great admirers of La, La Povera. And they, they, they never saw those artworks. They only saw it in books. So I think that the, this experience in Mexico is somebody who came from this knowledge from books, who knew everything from the books. And obviously they had traveled to Venezia, but to come to Mexico and see how complex the culture was for him, that was truly so important. And with that, I want to tell you about a trip that we made several times, but one in particular with Jim Durham, which was Chama. And Graciela Turbide was uh, in this uh, study in photography. And we were going through the old roads and we were going to Aguerwete. And it was incredible to see uh, uh, this tree of, full of clothing or this umbilical cords. And on the road to Charma, the first time that he went, it was on May 3rd. And so all the mountains had the three crosses with the sheets over them. And that drove them crazy because there's this special experience that was very interesting that we both had that uh, we were both the same age that I would see this anthropological aspect as being very interesting. But the popular art, I believe that I thought it was the most attractive thing. And for him, it was the conversation from the contemporaneous art um, to what happened with the different uh, uh, materials or, or traditions. And so for him, it was very important as a part of his pieces to talk about how in the pyramids, there was this grass that was over the ruins. And so Elso loved it because it reminded him of a piece of night and day. Mm -hmm. And so there was a relationship between the experience and be, with the contradictions of the Mexican society of uh, its own richness and they found there what they had read about but in different er, parts but it was very clear in media well we know that his collection of different objects which is wonderful and it's worthy of being in a museum but he was a collector of images experiences and I believe that's why Carrillo he has to do with the materialization of, as Olga told, like the brooms are the ones that he saw in Tepoztlan. And of course, we went to Popo, Popo the volcano, and he found that that's, that sand was loaded, but his materials, on the other hand, were chosen with the idea that it didn't have to be only the quality of the material, but it was where it came from. And that's why Armando Sanz was so persistent in that. And so obviously the communication with Gerardo and Carlos, it wasn't in vain that they uh, developed this work in the 90s. It had to do a lot with the fact that they understood this connection very well based on their own interest. And it's very interesting that our marriage, uh, they would invite me they, to go to these exhibitions with uh, from the 80s or, or the 90s. So, so both things were not in, did not come together. So I think that the culture uh, and the fact that he, they read so much, that was so important. And now I compare it a bit to the experience that the Mexican painters in the 80s we, that we had we didn't see the paintings, we just saw reproductions in the books. So then this idea of the, the painting, it's better made because it's a bad photography. So it would um, almost make the whole visage a lot smoother. But I mean, so it's not that, the important part in the influence, they do manage, and I believe that Bedia and Peros Monzon are important. They manage to make this type of negotiation with this, uh, with this movement that was being proposed in Mexico. But then we had the such firmness in the critics and and the the strict 
museum. So there wasn't this dialogue about the materials and what was involved. So it was important to have this conversation about the materials. So it's for me, it's been very interesting that even with having a small number of Elso's pieces, there is this mythology, one of them, Martí, with Cuba and the heart with Mexico. So it's very interesting that in this dialogue, these two parts continue to be there, and I understand them very well. But let's say that I would get comments from African, uh, I'm sorry, uh, from Cuban artists asking if they were as well made as they seemed, because they thought that it was very sad that he had um, tried to avoid this part that was more fragile, that was more spiritual. So it had this role. But on the other hand, the versions of the Martí that I heard about, I thought they were fabulous because it was an image that represented an, uh, this rebellious act. And it's interesting that even now with this piece that is so fragile and so beautiful, it, the fact that there were so many versions, so many different representations of it, they are mythical um, and, and what they meant, especially in such hard times. And then the heart, on the other hand, it structured this work that was so interesting about the materials and these ephemeral materials and sacred materials that also that if you see it, it's uh, during the time of Michael Tracy that he also came on board with this idea of, of the idea of the sacred. And with Sylvia, Sylvia Gruner, I believe it was a coincidence, a strong coincidence. Um, and it was a different experience where the body, her body and her fragility are always present. Um, and it's with a different story, but it connects with a very interesting way. But that's what I wanted to add. And I believe that that trip to Chalma and also we went later on to Malinalco and Jimmy Dirk and I, we it's a trip that we made many, many times. So it's this intersection between the popular and the occult and the past and the present and how the scenery would change because of the festivities. And then the scenery was something that he was fascinated by it. Yes, it's very, very interesting that. So if we talk about uh, this point, that's almost like a blind point that we also have to be uh aware in relationship to the um, the way that Carmen Dieta intervenes in Mexico. Because, and, and this is, I'm going to say it with, <laughs> with maybe the, the, the symbol of the copyright symbol, and I would like to be able to do it sometime. It's very clear the way how the spaces in Oaxaca in particular, where um, Mendieta works, they have this meaning of the how they're placed in the space with the relationship with the artwork. And so it needs, so it's not just an isolated image that it's not fully, it doesn't cover it all, but it's very clear to me with, and it's just a coincidence with Oledi that I went up to, um, I went to the, on top of the hotel because I realized that's where Mendieta's photos were there. And I wanted to understand what were the surrounding, the, what the surrounding scenery was Mendieta was. So I wanted to know what, about the valley. I wanted to see the church tops and I, the rooftops. And I wanted to see, and I mean, you are completely right about the fact that the emphasis that I place in the way that very in a very direct way that the exhibit that also and and it's more than just his presence how it's it's so involved in this change of materials and it's at the moment that the that the installation it's something that has awed a lot of artists how he all of these challenges were solved in in this culture that at the time it was had this neurotic emphasis of basically obtaining like the black of Subaran to cite another colleague. But but then on the another part that I don't 
think it's all, all that irrelevant is that the difficult, how difficult the, it, how it was for the local public to perceive how radical this option um, that now we would say it's a localized option, but I'm not gonna name names, but a colleague who's very important cultural critic who has had a complete change. His pre his first impact was completely diminished because I actually, I even got angry. I remember being angry on the ramp and going into a museum. He said, well, that's what balls used to do, wasn't it? And I remember my inner anger that saying, oh, I didn't understand. And so then the second time something happened that he understood perfectly that that was not the point. The point was that those operations, to call them that way, uh, was the fact of how we were launching and presenting these cultural aspects. And it's something that uh, maybe I, I didn't say it properly, but what they have there is certainly in these two mythologies that Magali mentioned, it wasn't so much, it just, you know, sending them off. It was trying to create this, this space that was unified, like Bre, like Vedia, uh, and others, uh, other Cubans that were in Mexico, the Perez, there was, I believe that they are in that common uh, goal or, uh, and Vedia talked about the different delegation, the, the piece of Sao Paulo the African delegation and the indigenous um, culture coming together. And so all of a sudden, it was possible to see uh, in relationship to this heart, two paths, colonial paths that have been oppressed and that had not come together um, fully aware of it. And that's why Elso's work was so dangerous in a way to say it briefly, but it was certainly, it was about understanding the materials, what they uh, contributed, uh, the meaning and how it mobilized the cultures and the stories. <clears throat> and I had not perceived it with such clarity and something that we did not have in the local repertoire um, because the image and the meaning were, well, this symbiotic uh, atmosphere, it, it, it had this conflict with the space. And then in the seventies, the structuralism of Mexico, it came to play into play into this emphasis, not just what you're talking about. And I remember there's a joke that I inherited from um, Juan Archa, a critic from um, Peru, Peru, Mexican. Uh, Esquira, this uh, Italian editorial, because they everybody had learned with all the with all the images from them. It was never in live artwork. They were always learning through the, those images only. Um, and so it's it's having these materials that if if it wasn't just through El Sol's exhibit, but I believe that it's substantial. The, the effect that, that the exhibition had in the artist that um, was briefly mentioned there, but it brought this particip Cuban participation to Mexico. So all of a sudden um, the materials became more important. So, so it was unequivocally substantial. So there were all these subst substances. It wasn't just about color or shapes or words. Yes, I believe that the fragility of the materials, um, let's say in the, um, in not, not, not that it was meant to last forever, but it was just gonna be there for a moment. It was so important in what the effect is on the, on the public. And that surprises me a lot because it talks about how I was, just learning how I saw all of you. And I mean, not everything was explained to me. And, and I didn't realize that Armando had gone to uh, Havana to see Elso. 
so my perception was just that Armando was that he understood something that I did not understand. And to me, it was almost magical that he all of a sudden would say, but it has to be this way in relationship to this space. There's no other way. It's got to be this way. And so he would, all of a sudden, he would move the mask and he would say, it had to be here. I don't know if I'm expressing, expl explaining myself well, but I, I have this impression that the way it was expressed, it was almost as if, the space was dictated by this place. And, and, and so what you're telling me about this conversation, obviously it's very decisive, but it does not take away these, this idea that I have that Armando had walked through that space and he had thought about it. And so it was implied what he wanted to see, even though it was his workshop was in a small space in Sacaronimo. Well, what I believe was that I still believe that in his era, I still thought that he was gonna go back to Mexico. And so they didn't really talk about the exhibit itself, the installation, but, and so he you know, had always this way of doing the installation. He has different diagrams as you saw it. He would make a lot of drawings, but I believe that the decision about the <clears throat> strings, I don't know if Elso would have liked it, but he had these essays and he had these ideas and drawings and what was very clear. And I believe that was something that was very important to Elso was the fact that you would come in and you would almost put on the mask. and. Uh, and Armando was so close to us, so they were such good friends that they had this conversation, such close conversation, but Armando went to say goodbye to Havana because he knew that Elso was going to die. And, uh, and, then, and Armando mentioned something, but um, he explained to me that Elso had passed away. Actually, I, I heard the news from Armando. And perhaps to touch on this magical aspect or more spiritual, we have um, a question from our audience and I would uh, invite the audience. We have about 15 minutes left and we can take some questions. So if you can um, add them on the chat and uh, we'll, I, I, I will share them with my audience. The first question is, did Elso understand his creative process as practicing art religion or both? I believe that for him, religion was not, was not a specific denomination or a cult. It was like a, a perspective of the world, the, the Afro-Cuban uh, religion. I mean, what he wanted to express through his work was this connection between this mystic and reality and and also the idea of uh, this mythical thought that something that, a story that you tell that has to do with a connection that goes beyond you. And I don't think that he would define himself as a religious artist, even though everything is uh, based on things that he learned uh, in through his religious education. Obviously, I'm not a witness, a firsthand witness like Magali, but interestingly, the text that I wrote for the book that Olga is going to uh, be kind enough to publish in English. I didn't dare to think that I couldn't touch that because, not because it wasn't important, but because I feel that that it's something that it has a meaning, but I think that we should say something like uh, Elsa's project, it, in a very, radical and uh, innovative way to renovate this intervention with the world and you know us as humans from a different perspective in this other philosophy. And it was based on a tradition that was passed on in a very strict Afro-Cuban uh, way as a, as somebody that has been inducted into it. And, and he, implemented it uh, based on what I have been told against even um, this concern for his own spiritual life or 
his colleagues that came from a very um, from an earlier formation and or education in those tradition uh, Afro-Cuban traditions, and also his very well informed perspective, and it, and he was intuitively correct about the traditions, the Mesoamerican traditions, and they were alive, but the ones that were beyond uh, having witnessed, uh, and like I have not experienced, like the experience in Shanma that I had not witnessed, but he had, it had like this direct impact on him. So uh, uh, unlike Marta Maria Perez Prado, that she marked a limit, a transgressional limit uh, with the prohibitions in Afro-Cuban aspects in her photography or the way that she would divide very clearly the objects of ritual value uh, and then art objects. And, and so, but they have this relationship that had to come together in, in Palamonte, but he, Palamonte, he tried to have this more substantial art that would transform the world with these artworks that uh, here in the West, we would say that they were um, transcendental. And so, and so I was the idiot in charge. I was young and very much an idiot at the time, but, but it was completely amazing and extraordinary. And I was completely challenged in my information and, and Marxist and this positivism and post my uh, skeptical postmodernism, and, and that's how I would say about me the stories that you would tell about Marti, and in particular about the effect that, yeah, and his illness. And to hear them from somebody who did not have this faith, like Mitzer, uh, it made it even more, um, more extreme. So there was a relationship with Elso's work that had to do with his own health. And as a matter of fact, and as he told it himself, it took him a long time to find his own voice. It was after his surgery about regarding his ulcer that he was in the hospital, that he had this relevation, so to speak. But he knew this idea, he knew what he had to do. But if you look at his work, the idea of this life and death, this idea of there is a different uh, plane this is not something that he told me, but I had this impression that there was this uh, self-knowledge that he had when he worked on the pieces. And it wasn't in vain that all the bodies were all based on his body and all his figures. And he didn't do it on purpose, but there's this rela interesting relationship in that morphology. So in the last picture that I was taking of him, there's this picture where what the horse is at, but there's the last one where he is with the mask behind him. They have the same shape, uh, uh, and he made it with with the tumor that he had. So, and he made the mask before he knew he had the tumor. So, this very mystical relationship with his work, and so I think that's why he's always uh, compared to Ana Mandieta in the silhouette. But in general, I believe that that's something that happens frequently in art, that in some way, I'm not going to say that it's like premonitory in any way, but there is a connection that's very strange. And in Enzo's case, it was amazing, special with the Martí. That crack that he had is basically on the same side that he had the tumor. So it's true that during many years, my mother, I had in my house, she said, daughter, that, that, that figure is alive. And when we brought it to the cultural center after it was in Pompidou, it was Clifford who told me, I saw this piece in the Pompidou and it was alive. And now it is an art piece. Now you will be able to sell it. And that's when I gave it to Olga Viso. So there was this energy, this connection uh, in energy. And it happens with some other pieces. And I have some ideas that some works from uh, um, that he collect uh, a collector of uh, art from the Congo. And I say this in, at his house and the pieces, it's like they're sweating and it's super strange. They have like this vibe that's super strange. 
And so I believe that it is the same thing that he had um, in the energy with his pieces. So uh, there was this, uh, a good frame, a good uh, painting is alive. It, it's not that the, the connection with the artist and the author, but um, some of them even, it seems like they die and they lose that energy. But for him, he had this thing that was hard for us to understand, but but also the time that he dedicated to his work, that also dedicated to his work was so much. But he worked very slowly. It took him a long time to create every single piece. Yes, but it was almost like a religious practice, that it was a process that's cumulative and that you dedicate yourself to it. And it seems like a, the process is like a ritual that also influences artistical process. It was not just a religious practice. It was a ritualistic practice. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm sorry to interrupt Olga. No, no, uh, go ahead. I would like to uh, add, share this issue with religion, this category. It, it's a awfully problem, problematic and it's this Catholic theory. And I say it with all the respect that it's due. It's a tradition that it's the Christian tradition that pretends to be universal and it categorizes all others and places them in different categories. So it's a tradition and here, I, I'm going into a niche here, but it, it's like this, there's this dead God like Christ. And so the, it, there is this division between life and religion, but then the other traditions, they don't have that, that division. So we have the problem that even the tension that Magali, uh, that Dietborn uh, presents, and, and and it also has a great influence on the text that I wrote that the piece of art or the ritual that break from the having the artwork and not just the il illustration, uh, many artists have, it's, it's a problem that comes from this division. So then, on the one hand, it's true that also inter it, 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 he intervenes in this with a very practical transgression of, of limits and all these prohibitions and all these concerns about uh, the tradition in Santeria. So that has this logic that is very, uh, very, uh, forward and it's breaking with the order. And so I tend to believe that other artists did mark that difference like Ovedia, um, but it, they did it in a different way. But to say clearly that that's what happening there, what it makes me think is that it's interfering with how these live traditions uh, crash, clash between art and life in the West. And, and so he is like the warrior that also comes in, in this crossroads. And, and so that's what makes his work so important. And I think that that's why he has the effect that he has on us. Uh, and I personally confess that that is the effect that it has on me. I know that he is the crossroads of those uh, conflicts, those issues. And the uh, African traditions, the Mesoamerican traditions, European in reference to the limits of the artistical area and political and what uh, the Westerns called religious. And so to present all of this in a different way, and I understand it and I feel it in my body that to talk in those terms puts me in a plane that I really, I don't know how to handle. <laughs> and so it happens to me that, that I'm at the limit, I'm at the border, that there has to be something on the other side. But then I wanna take this question that Joanna Aviles made and I wanna take it head on. Yes, please. So she asked, how does this impact, this work impact the culture, Mesoamerican culture and, the 
new artist in Mexico. And there's something very important here. And it's the fact that in the past years we've lived and we're a bit behind in, in the scene, so to speak. And it's a true evaluation of the traditions of the cultural power and generations and, and the nations uh, in our geography. So th th this mixture of the Western um, mixing in with more indigenous cultures. So then there's this whole area that area that comes up, becomes so it's it's very tricky because Elena insists in she is an intellectual of Mije. It's not indigenous culture, but because it's almost like a religion, it, and so it's colonial. So the political politicians in Mexico continue to categorize it that way, but we don't dare to uh, do that. But then there's artists now was Zapotecas, and there are artists that present themselves like, like that and, and they present themselves, but this is a problematic indigenous way to present it. And so it becomes, the issue is based on the challenge that are basically represents for the entire dominating culture in Mexico, the fact that the indigenous artist is not the object of representation. So there's all this abuse and, and from the state of the nation. And, and so to have these artists, this intellectual mix it, mix this or now what's that they have, they have, they present to us how, what is the logic in their own traditions and what do they do with the text, for example, from Lopez Osti. So then my first answer would be, that as many other things, I would want to ask those artists, uh, and just like to mention a name, Noe Martinez, I would ask him, how do you position yourself in all this? Or, or if we go a bit further back, Fernando Palma, he's got, does El so have an, any importance for you? I would have to ask Maruj Mendes, um, the artist in Chamula, what do you think about all these materials? And I have not done that. And so then my role right now would be to present those questions and what's emerging in Mexico is this shift in, in who's the protagonist, who we're talking about, what nations, and so to make a bit of a commercial, go see um, the exhibit Huecos del Agua, Holes of the Water, um, that Amparo is in doing in, Pe in Puebla with Itzel Vargas. And the issue now is going to be, the, the question is how can you take this uh, or perceive this work that's prophetic, that's pioneering uh, from a different, and, and then there's idiots like me in charge that we're gonna have to answer these questions, but perhaps Nagali has, can enlighten us. Well, I believe that what did happen in the 90s, which was very interesting, is that this, re, this new perspective began of the, for the materials, for the artistic process, what we're talking about, this rigidity, this, uh, sternness and of this idea on the one hand it was truly valuable to create these cultural institutions but then it was a bit dogmatic because it what was convenient what wasn't and i think that what happened with Enzo's exhibition was uh, an installation that marked the difference because all of these materials of this construction that was not made piece by piece but you had to read it almost like an essay this connection with all of the important texts that had not been seen as something from the past, but something that's happening in the present. I believe that that did give the option to work in a different way. So I believe that what you were saying and telling us about Raso, it let Victor Raso, I believe it was that he does the thing about the pyramids or uh, 
or things that are more programmatic. I'm sorry, Vicente Rosso. Vicente Razo. Forgive me, Vicente, but uh, well, there is this opening, and it's important to me thinking about the art. Um, Witzerba is the key figure at the time that has to do with the with this uh, the way we perceive this religion presentation or aspect of it. It had to have some humor to it, uh, of some laughter to incorporate these popular forms as a part of the identity. It, it's different in the 90s, and you truly start to see this how it's met it materializes and how the construction changes. So it's this mixture that it's not Westerner, it's not Oriental, it's not African. It is truly fragmented. And I believe that's important. But that have been, that was perhaps established. And, and, and in the 90s, it's very direct. And Vicente Razu and his hypotheses, uh, it was very direct and it was, he recognized it. He admitted it, but the question is right now, I think that's why it's so appropriate that this exhibit is right happening right now because these questions that this gen that gen Cuban generation and then all these Mexican artists were the first um, witnesses and they presented this issue and so now they're going to be the subject matter of the next decade. So how do we define this culture in a way that it doesn't make assumptions uh, and it does not um, take over in the small play presentations and the bigger scenario? Yes, I believe that's essential, but we're almost out of time. But I wanted to mention to, or, or remind everybody that the exhibit, uh, Elso's exhibit in Mexico City at Carrillo Hill in the 90s, it had a great impact and that also, including Elso's work in the exhibition in Terana de in, in the America that was organized by Mosquera, Carolina Ponce, who traveled to many places in um, Latin America. It had a great impact in the artists, in the generation of artists of the 90s. And perhaps you don't make that relationship, but there are artists who have talked about the great impact that Elso had when they saw his work. Uh, Salcedo, Javier Telles, Valleta. And so there's artists all over Latin America. And it was part of the transparency of God, but Martin in particular, it had such a great impact to have the access to those pieces. And it's not the pieces, not the reason why this happened, but this this installation is key. We have these artworks that have not been seen, and now your essay that is included in the book that you wrote 20 years ago, and now it's going to be uh, available in English. You speak very clearly about the project, Elso's project, pre-colonial, and, and before we even knew the correct terminology for it. And so was already a part of that conversation, initial conversation, and now it has this important resonance in the present in bringing what was also something that impressed me a great is all the different artists in the in that are part of this collective installation, artists that knew him and had not been here, and artists that were not from the Caribbean, but they feel that the context, the conversation of what the installation offers, it offers this more profound context to all of these issues that have been presented so clearly through Elso's works. And he is the center of that. I think that on the one hand, what you said, it has to do with something that's very important. And it's that this is one of those cases when Five artworks are more important than 500. It is very clear that how Magali talks about the how slow he did all his works. It had to do with what he was doing. It wasn't logical in any in, in any pre-established uh, notion. So it was something that at that moment, he was breaking all the molds. He was breaking the mold and 
it, for people like me, and I'm going to say it, and I'm going to be harsh about it, it's because they were uh, presenting a different perspective of what the Cuban regime, regime was presenting in, in the areas that they could be revolutionary and, uh, and evolutionary. So there is also an explanation that's very important for the resistance of the Mexicans because it, there were references to the fact that the Mexican state abused and continued to abuse systematically, even nowadays. And so now the reaction of the artists want to wanting to criticize this. And so it's like not being able to come near these that were like um, indigenous views or Mexican views. So it was a fact that you did not negotiate with the power. So uh, with the domesticated and power and so one of the things that Erso and Oyas Bey and Vedia and others and Leandro, to many like me, they, who I was not an artist, uh, but I was just uh, somebody who appreciated artists, but it gave us the, the, the oppressed or the repressed possibilities that we had within us. And I don't want to go too deep into that that what you have to think about what what's behind it and, and I mean you and it wasn't perhaps the right language it's not the language so much but it's the it's something that becomes a permanent criticism that becomes transcendental and so all of a sudden there are manipulations so that it becomes something that's truly um a tool that te a teaching tool so uh, I truly believe that because I will tell you a little bit about the idiot in charge. So for me to hear about Mosqueda, one of the Cubans in the 80s, it, I discovered that it was possible to be a pioneer. And it wasn't the closed archive of recycling the historical language, uh, the way it had happened in Mexico with the postmodernism. So there was a possibility here that we could transform the world in some way. So of course, not in the way, uh, the archaic way that we knew, but that's why we saw, I saw him as an artist living on the edge. And so that is something, a, a door that was open and it's not very clear what we're gonna do with a door because it's a bit broken down, but it's not closed. But it is very important that there should be, we should, uh, there should be a projection of this idea and a lot of the people that explore it and even we don't know what to do with some of some of it but perhaps it has to be do with a bit of Marti and Elso's heart at the at that level I mean I do take responsibility because that's why I don't want to change his text that of talking of, of about Elso like one of those moments that that has to do with the reconstruction of America and so I continue to see the works and I still have that euphoria when I see them. And, 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 and it's, it goes beyond who's on top of who or who's important. And it's just all the details. I believe this is a good place to stop. I don't know if Magali, you would like to add anything. I just want to say that this is incredible that everything did um, everything with little branches that is still alive, that it, it was meant to last five minutes and you see it and it's like it's alive and it's it's wonderful. It's very impressive. So thank you so much to both of you. It has been a very deep conversation and, 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 and we get a glimpse of Elso and all the other artists and thank you for everybody that participating today. So Thank you so much for all the support that you have given with the exhibition, uh, all your thoughts, your writings. It has been fabulous for me. So it's been a great resource as well. So thank you so much to all the public and I hope you can come see the exhibit. It's here until September and uh, it's gonna be in, the next one's gonna be November to March in Miami. So you could see there and then uh, the book will be published. It's a 400 page book that will be published in Spanish and English. And 
there's many uh, that we had did not have uh, in English before, but there's new text. There's voices of different artists that participate and uh, giving, offering their thoughts on Elsa. So have a good afternoon and thank you so much for everyone. Thank you so much, Olga. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.